fellow travellers, welcome to yet another Fuds on Film podcast. We recently spoke about the Star Trek films of the original series cast, and in a shocking turn that will surprise all, we are now going to talk about the films of the Next Generation cast, because we are mavericks like that. Yes. Who could have seen it we, coming? We are on the bleeding edge here of doing the really obvious, ordinary thing. Just when you think you've got all the answers, we change all the questions. I am Drew Tavendale, and the voice you've heard there to talk with me about Star Trek tonight was Scott Morris. Delighted to meet you. And, well, I guess we just crack on. I maybe before we start, I don't know how you feel, Scott, but although I was familiar with the original series a little and the original series films, certainly them being in the cinema when we were growing up, mm. for me, this is... This is my Star Trek. Yeah. It's the six o'clock every Tuesday or Wednesday night, whatever it was, in BBC Two, sit have your dinner, watch Star Trek, watch yet another episode where Wesley Crusher's homework eats the ship, <laughs> or something in the holodeck takes over the ship. Yeah. Those are the main two stories that happened every week. Or Data gets uh, worried about his cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, because of the time that was on, the time of our lives it was on, these are these are my Star Trek. Like everyone had their own bond. Unfortunately, ours was the worst one. <laughs> Roger Moore is a terrible, terrible person. Hashtag, not my bond. <laughs> but yes, these are our Star Trek. Yeah, likewise. When I when someone mentions Star Trek to me, this is more likely what I think of. Uh, it's going to be uh, the next generation and the Borg. It's not going to be... Captain Kirk uh, fighting a Klingon in a quarry. It's going to be something <laughs> to do with the, the Enterprise D, most likely, and mm-hmm. which is the, the era that we will start off in just now. Yes. Now, as far as the TV series, where I at the time enjoyed it a lot, but in retrospect, I think that there was a pretty awful ratio of oh, yeah. episodes that were any good to absolute dross. Oh yes, I, I, <laughs> I'm thinking it's at rate of really good ones is maybe in the, the low the under five percent. And there's yes, a lot of dreck um, when you go through some of these ones. They all popped up on Netflix, and I was flicking through them. I was like, that was garbage. That's garbage. That's rubbish. Hang on, what was I thinking when I was a kid? <laughs> now, as far as Deep Space Nine goes, I will defend that to the hilt because I really, really like Deep Space Nine. But TNG, not so much. That said, there are some particularly memorable episodes. One of which very much gave rise to one of the feature films, yes. and in my mind, the best one. But yes, there, there was a lot of dreck. So for every Borg episode, there was one where, as we said, the holodeck took over the ship. There was always the ones about Professor Moriarty for some mm-hmm. reason. And then Q, the walking deus ex machina, <laughs> uh, which was a terrible, terrible thing. Although Q didn't at least introduce the Borg into the series. But the question, I suppose... Is though, did the Next Generation series give rise to any decent films? So perhaps we could start off with if anything was generated, Scott. Oh, was that a link to Star Trek Generations? Well, like it's the best you're getting from it this time of night. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's just stay up front. Generations is a weird film. And I- <laughs> don't really understand why it exists. Um, I I suppose I can see some logic in setting up a passing of the baton, which we'll get to later, but really who or what this film was designed for escapes me. (laughs) I say this just now because if any of the forthcoming plot recap sounds a bit flimsy, well, I don't think that's my fault. (laughs) (laughs) You're suggesting perhaps that the best way to start a new series of Star Trek films isn't having a strange scene on a farm in Iowa where they're on horses and then cooking some eggs. Yes. Because that sounds captivating to me. <laughs> yes, that's more or less what I'm suggesting. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so this was seen as a handover between the old series, the original series and the Next Generation cast. So we start off in Kirk's era, uh, 2293, and he's the guest of honour during the launch of the USS Enterprise B. However, as is the way with the Enterprise, they soon receive a distress call from a few El Orion ships which are being bothered by a weird space anomaly, a wibbly, swirly energy ribbon thing that's ripping them apart. The next generation did like its strange space entities, didn't it? Yes, um, almost as much as Voyager. But <laughs> <laughs> So the Enterprise is able to save some of them, but Kirk seems to give his life in the efforts, heroically saving the Enterprise, but apparently being lost in space. 
we then rather inelegantly jump to a weird celebration of Worf's promotion in the Next Generation era, 2371, with the Enterprise D crew receiving another distress call from an observatory where they rescued the El Orion Dr. Tolian Soran, played by Malcolm McDowell, and I'll let you guess who the bad guy turns out to be. Is it Max von Sydow? Because it normally is. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it, I, I know he's not in this film, but I'm assuming it's probably him. It's Max von Sydow, yes. It's Bert Kwok. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Scott. For the rest of the evening, I'm not going to have <laughs> hey little hen in my head. <laughs> because as much as he was a henchman in Doctor No, and he was in things like Tenko, mm. largely I hear Bert Kwok and I think of Harry Hill. Yes. So thanks. <laughs> That's a good image to have. Also showing up in this are occasional uh, Next Generation series irritants, the Klingon Dumas sisters, who show up and cause a ruckus in a bird of prey, kidnapping Geordi LaForge and allowing Soran to fire off a star-destroying probe into the local, well, star, obviously. I think we should perhaps, uh, at this point, pause to briefly introduce the members of the Next Generation cast for any poor, uninitiated fellow somehow still listening to this podcast. This Next Generation Enterprise is captained by the allegedly French Jean-Luc Picard, played of course by Patrick Stewart. Um, the, from Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, so all occasional references to him being from France were pretty much immediately dropped after the first two series, I think. He used to occasionally say, merde, and then stopped for no good reason. Uh, I don't remember him saying that at all. <laughs> I remember a story with him having his brother in the vineyard, yeah. and there's a couple of, uh, his nephew was called René, and there's a couple of episodes, I think even one of the films, where you see the bottle of wine and it's from Picard. Yeah, um, Chateau, the, the, and that's it. I think the, there was that scene where he was riding a bicycle up and down the Enterprise with a stripy vest and a string of onions <laughs> around his neck, throwing well, garlic. Second, just just before <laughs> you finish that sentence, I'm like, what episodes? Oh, <laughs> oh, he's making a really funny joke. <laughs> Patrick Stewart plays a stoic, intelligent, diplomatic officer that's a far cry from Shatner's more swashbuckling character, which is supposed to be a reflection of Starfleet's alleged focus on peaceful exploration rather than the gunboat diplomacy of the original series, although, frankly, that's more of an ideal than an actuality as the series went on. It was common in the series, if less so for the films, for the action to be handled by the dashing first officer William Riker, played by Jonathan Frakes, who's a little closer to Kirk's punch-first, ask-questions-later attitude. What passes for science in the show is routinely handled by Spock Analog, the android data, <laughs> played by Brent Spiner, whose quest to better understand and become more like the humans he's modelled after is a recurring theme of the show and touched on in some of the films. Engineering, and surprisingly often the damsel in distress role falls to Geordie LaForge. <laughs> uh, LeVar Burton, a man whose defining and apparently only characteristic appears to be is blind, where where's Pfizer? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what is Geordie's character other than that? I know it, he's. <laughs> I like. Yeah, he's very likable, but it doesn't have. Yeah, but it doesn't doesn't have any traits really, does yeah. it? It's a it's a fair point. He's likable. I think Levar Burton's yeah. um a lot to do with that, and he is the friend of Riker, the friend of Data. Yeah, but yes, other than a sounding board in most instances. Or, or, yeah, he fails that red letter media test of, of describe George LaForge's, well, that's a Star Wars thing, but describe George LaForge's character without telling, given his name, a description or um, his job. And like, I, 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 um, look over there. <laughs> Yeah, so if you look over there, you will see weapons and hitting things duty, which falls to the big old Klingon Worf, played by Michael Dorn, who has exactly the same default characterization as all Klingons in the show. In that he is a chauvinistic, honor-obsessed, misogynistic, right-wing arsehole. Yes, but... Um, he, to put not too fine a point on it. <laughs> but he likes prune juice, so that's all right. It's a warrior's drink. Uh, <laughs> your, your medical needs on your stay in Enterprise will be covered by Beverly Crusher, Gates McFadden who is also the long-running source of romantic tension with Picard, and uh, nominally at least, the crew's mental health is safeguarded by <laughs> Commander <laughs> Diana Obvious Troy, played by Marina Sirtis. Oh, uh, I hate that character so much. The entire series, I don't think they found one use for her. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, and here actually, I think maybe it's the first contact commentary with Brandon Bragg and Ron Moore, and they say, no, finally they developed her, they made her sort of in charge of the schools and things like that because they were really struggling to find anything for her to do. <laughs> yes. And they talk about that it's a, it's a very, very 1980s thing, but I, I, United States 1980s thing, that an incredibly important thing in the future would be a therapist. Yes. <laughs> and I think even from the start, though, 
they were struggling to give her anything to do. In large, that her role existed to be, despite having like the, the seat next to the captain, incredibly yeah. important for some reason. But it's like, captain, I'm sensing hostility. <laughs> ah, hostility, you say, from these people here that just shot at us and tried to kill us. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Very useful. <laughs> You've been a great help, Troy. Your, your psionic ability is coming to its own there. Thanks for that. Yeah. It's not having a go at the actors at all or anything. I guess she's likable enough. It's just the character just should not have existed. <laughs> yes. Why are you? <laughs> yes. Okay, anyway, that aside, back at the ranch. Picard questions fellow El Orion and Starship barkeeper uh, Guinan, uh, an improbable job filled by Whoopi Goldberg, improbably, who fills us in on that there wibbly-wobbly space ribbon. It acts as a randomly destructive gateway to the Nexus, an extra-dimensional realm where time has no meaning and anyone can experience whatever they desire. Soran is driven to get there, and the Enterprise crew then figure out that the reason he's blowing up stars is to divert the ribbon's course over a planet so he can be absorbed into the Nexus without having to rely on a starship not blowing up before he transfers. The problem is that the next and final star on his hit list also has a densely populated world orbiting it. The crew head off to stop this, with Picard beaming off to the planet's surface to try and convince Soran to stop this madness while the remaining bridge crew fend off that their duras bird of prey. This doesn't go all that well for either party, with Enterprise destroying their adversary but crippling them at the same time, forcing an unceremonious crash landing, while Picard fails in his attempt and is pulled into the Nexus along with Soran. However, a wild deus ex machina appears in the form of <laughs> Guinan's force ghost or something, <laughs> who convinces Picard that the idyllic life he's created for himself in the Nexus is a hollow illusion and informs him that he can use the Nexus's unique properties as an undo button, and at this time he might be able to convince his Nexus neighbour, Captain Kirk, to help out in what I suppose is supposed to be a dream team-up, which they do, obviously. Now... I suppose the first point of analysis you have to make about Generations is that it's not very good. Now, much like the original cast series of films, it's not particularly the actor's fault who by this point know the characters inside out and provide engaging turns. It's just the things that they've been asked to do and say that is the problem. <laughs> just, just those minor points. <laughs> yes, just, just the film bit of it. It's perhaps best typified by the villains of the piece. Not satisfied by one poorly motivated nutball in McLaren's Soran, there's an equally poorly drawn bunch of Klingons added to the mix that only seem to exist to give the rest of the crew outside of Picard something to do in the final act. Needless to say, not a one of them are particularly compelling or interesting. That's a real issue with the structure of the film too, hopping around between focal points in a way that doesn't really fulfil a traditional three-act structure, and it's fine to deviate from that, but not for these reasons. It's Weird structure is a byproduct of the need to go out of the way to cram Picard and Kirk together, and my overwhelming concern about this comes back to the point uh, I'd raised way back at the start of this diatribe. Who thought this was necessary? As mentioned on one level, there's a sense behind handing over the baton, but that's not really what happened here. I mean, after all, the Next Generation series had already ran for seven series and finished before we got to this film, so it's not really a handover. The Next Gen crew had been off running a completely different race for the best part of a decade on a very popular TV show, so this film is less a baton handover, and more like when there's a long-distance race running in an athletics event, when there's also a long jump going on the centre of the field. The only people that this would be introducing to the new crew would be those whose only exposure to Star Trek is the films. And that's surely such a narrow sliver of the potential audience that it's not worth catering to? I mean, anyway, I don't on a conceptual level mind there being a handover of the film series, provided the handover doesn't play merry hell with the narrative, and here it most certainly does. There's no sense of any story being told here, a few allusions to mortality aside, but even that is buried under the convoluted plot and space anomalies that might as well be a flying magic wand for all the sense it makes. This is a confused, misbegotten mess of a film, although in its defence it's a well-produced, confused, misbegotten mess of a film, which, along with a highly able cast, affords it a baseline level of watchability that's perhaps above the worst of the original series outings, <laughs> but not by a great deal. I would give this one a miss. I don't see what purpose it serves in the, the greater scheme or arc of these films, and it just seems like a, a grand waste of everyone's talents. No, no, Scott, you're wrong. Clearly it's very, very important to realise that one of Captain Picard's great, great dreams is to be some sort of 
Victorian father yes. <laughs> with his yeah, children thanks, in thanks crushed that. velvet suits or something and speaking <laughs> in very clipped upper class tones yeah. <laughs> although I think that's maybe more an American's idea of what British family <laughs> life is like or something rather than it being something that actually makes sense yes. for the character but <laughs> it's a strange one yeah, it's, like I mentioned earlier too the idea that you have the the classic famous Star Trek captain James T. Kirk and then you have this the new and clearly in every way better Jean-Luc Picard <laughs> in terms of both the character and the actor. But these two iconic characters in Star Trek, and at the time obviously they were the only two captains. <laughs> uh, well, I suppose Deep Space Nine had started by that point, but it may actually have been before Benjamin Sisko got his promotion. So maybe technically wasn't a captain. Anyway, you've got these two iconic captains. Like, Nerd. Okay, let's, like, Nerd. <laughs> Sorry. Can I just remind you that we are recording a podcast about Star Trek, uh, our second podcast about Star Trek. Self nerd, <laughs> and it's uh, so yeah. The idea of these two captains together, yeah, that's really appealing. What I didn't really have in my fantasy setting, if I had one, was that they would be cooking some eggs. <laughs> yes, going for going for a nice horse ride together. Yeah, maybe you know a battle of wills on the bridge of the Enterprise, or they having to come together to find some way to defeat a can-like enemy, a really devious enemy. Hmm. No, a rickety bridge, some stones and some eggs. <laughs> okay. I don't find the animations awful by any means, but it's in no way good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not the worst DNG film outing. Goodness knows it's not the worst <laughs> DNG film outing, but it's it's a pretty underwhelming way to begin their big screen Career, as it were. Yeah, I don't remember disliking it all that much until I sat down to do this and actually write some notes about it. And when you actually have to think about this film, <laughs> it just flies apart in every which direction. <laughs> I think when That's you're watching the- it, um, as I say, because it is you know, quite slickly produced and it's got a cast that knows these roles very well, it uh-huh. can get away with quite a lot just and just sort of wing it. But if you sit down and try and <laughs> spend any thought on this at all, oh my God, does it just fly apart? Yeah, I mean, that's often a, an internal battle that's going on in my head because often it's just impossible for my brain to stop working at all. But sometimes yeah. you can just get into the swing of a thing. So if it's got a good rhythm. Yeah. And this at least moves along quite briskly. It doesn't, apart from the breakfast scene and the <laughs> yes. horse riding thing, it doesn't dip in pace too much. And so you're just like, you're watching this and it's like, okay, but yes, you, you start to think about it and it just <laughs> explodes. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's not good. And then, then whether they didn't think it was necessary or didn't think that they could do it or simply didn't know how, but their way of getting out of the Nexus was apparently wish for it because <laughs> they think they're in the Wizard of Oz or something. Click your heels together three times, Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to the Enterprise. <laughs> I want to go back to the Enterprise. <laughs> yeah. It's also disappointing given who wrote it too because it was written by Brandon Braga and Ron Moore who had started doing so much interesting stuff on Deep Space Nine by that point yeah. and who had been heavily involved in the writing of the last few seasons of The Next Generation on television and you know, as we mentioned there's a lot of terrible episodes in there but they are responsible for some of the more interesting ones including yeah. some of the Borg ones for example and the fact that this was their big screen outing it's really rather disappointing. Yes. Yes, um, a poor show from all involved, I think. Indeed. However, perhaps fortunately, <laughs> given how bad the animations was, though, the same two writers were kept on for the next film. And this time they're on ground that they're obviously more comfortable with and had a lot more to write about because the Borg are back. I am talking, of course, about Star Trek First Contact. The Enterprise D having been destroyed at the end of Generations, but as Picard observes, there were plenty more letters left in the alphabet. We begin Star Trek First Contact aboard the Enterprise E, imaginatively named a sort of more militaristic, muscular ship than the television-based Enterprise D had been. Awoken from a nightmare inside of a nightmare, Captain Picard is thinking about his experience of being assimilated by the Federation's most dangerous enemy, the Borg, when he is contacted by Starfleet to inform him that the long-dreaded invasion of the Federation by the beehive-like cyborg menace has begun. But, given that he was once part of them, his presence is not required. Unsurprisingly, Picard doesn't take this well, 
and he is soon ignoring orders so that he can partake in the entertaining, if short, space battle that gets the film going. What is, perhaps, surprising though, is that the invasion force sent to destroy the Federation and assimilate Earth consists of a whopping... one ship. Now, to be charitable, perhaps the idea simply is that Starfleet is so comprehensively overmatched by the Borg that a single vessel is sufficient, but it does feel a little underwhelming. There is another possibility, of course. Can we all say budgetary constraint? <laughs> but either way, the idea that an entire civilization could be destroyed by one solitary spaceship does mean that absolutely no method of overcoming such a foe can seem in any way believable. Resistance would be indeed futile. But maybe I'm overthinking this. They could just upload a virus from a comparatively Stone Age computer or something, I suppose. <laughs> Or perhaps fire a torpedo down an exhaust port of an otherwise gargantuan and impenetrable machine? So, just in the nick of time, Picard and the Enterprise warp into the battle, and amidst the wreckage of pretty much the entire fleet, the good captain directs the remaining Federation ships to concentrate their fire on the exhaust port of the otherwise gargantuan and impenetrable <laughs> Borg ship. Hmm. Dead ship then promptly explodes, which is convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that worked out well. <laughs> but uh, before its demise, the Borg Cube launches another vessel. In an unexpected and frankly shocking departure, it's a sphere, not a cube, which is, I have to point out to you, an entirely different basic geometric form, <laughs> which then travels back in time to assimilate Earth in the past and save them from all the bother of fighting the Federation at all. Oh, oh I know this one. They need to go and get a whale, right? <laughs> well... Possibly. I don't want to spoil it for the kiddies. <laughs> Dispensing with all of that tiresome slingshot around the sun nonsense that Captain Kirk had to endure, old Jean-Luc instructs his helmsman to press the follow the Borg back in time button or something, and off they go to Earth shortly after the Third World War. The crew now find themselves with two tasks to undertake, find warp pioneer Zephram Cochrane and restore his craft in time to make the warp flight that will finally bring humanity into the wider galaxy and do a spot of pest control, as some of the Borg have snuck their way onto the Enterprise when they weren't looking and have set up shop. <laughs> now, while Wrath of Khan was based on an original series episode, the story of First Contact is by far the most dependent on its TV-bound origin, being a continuation, more or less, of the events of the two-part Best of Both Worlds episode from the middle of the Next Generation's run. But the screenwriters Brandon Bragg and Ron Moore do a pretty good job of getting the bulk of the necessary information into the film without too many plodding exposition scenes. Alfie Woodard's Fish Out of Water character Lily is the main recipient of the information, but a combination of good acting, good writing, and the character also being an emotional foil and conscience for Picard, and not simply an exposition device, ensure that bringing newcomers up to speed isn't painful. In addition to Lily, there are two other notable additions to the cast. The dependable James Cromwell as the crotchety Zephyr Cochrane, who does a sterling job of making his character a never-meet-your-heroes list while never actually being a total asshat, <laughs> and also managing to almost, almost still, the cringeworthy. And you people, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek line. <laughs> which is possibly the most awkward way to get a film's title into a film there's ever been yes. and a wonderfully creepy yet sensual Alice Krieger as the Borg Queen now, these are of course very familiar roles for all the cast by this point they've been doing them for a decade but Patrick Stewart in particular seems to relish being able to stretch himself a little out of Picard's usual calm and assured demeanour as Trek once again touches on Moby Dick but with Picard this time in the role of Ahab. LeVar Burton and Brent Spiner are in a comfortable groove as LaForge and Data, though Data, uh, sorry, LaForge still doesn't really have a character of his own, though Brent Spiner at least is given some engaging scenes with the Queen involving literal temptations of the flesh, <laughs> and there are a few surprisingly entirely tolerable fan service cameos, Dwight Murdoch from the A-Team Schultz and Robert Picardo notably. Marina Sirtis' Counselor Troy is still, naturally, given precisely <laughs> zero of importance to do, but she has at least allowed a few moments of fun and relaxation that are entertaining enough, while helping to sell that there is a, a camaraderie, warmth and friendship amongst the crew. Talking of relaxation, director Jonathan Frakes is remarkably at ease, and at peak Riker, 
in the relative <laughs> handful of scenes in which he is on screen. A not inconsequential feat, and indeed the writers, the director, and all of the regular cast seem to be on top form. The whole thing seeming like a well-oiled machine with everything firing pretty much just right. So it's a complete bloody mystery how this was entirely forgotten wholesale for the next two outings. <laughs> I know a lot of people really favour Wrath of Khan, but I think this is probably still my favourite of all the 10 original Star Trek films. Hmm. I really like First Contact. Yes, it's very much up there with Wrath of Khan. Probably edges out. Uh, I have, I guess, one major and one minor issue with it that's bothered me over the years. Uh-huh. Uh, the major one, uh, in general, as I say, I, I enjoy it very much. And uh, yes, it's, it's really good. I, I recommend it. My major issue with it, though, is what's been done to the Borg here. I think the very thing that made them terrifying was the complete lack of humanity. The, the idea that they would take everything that you are and absorb it and basically dilute your essence to a homeopathic level presence <laughs> in a collective mind, you know, that, that's just a concept that's, you know, it, it's just on the edge of what's understandable as a fate worse than death, and that's why they were so, you know, effective and you know, creepy and other, you know, enemies for the television series. But when you put a Borg queen in here, it basically humanizes them. And they're no longer this inscrutable mass of flesh and wires, but just a brainless, clunky-looking army for some crazy bent with the domination complex. <laughs> and I understand totally why it's been done. It makes it writing for them an order of magnitude easier. Yes, because there's a, a limit to what you can do with without having a focus of of the character. But yes, I agree with that to a degree that it does sort of make them less other. Yeah, it, when the whole point of them is that they are so so alien yeah and you can't understand them in human terms you suddenly have a basic a human figure then it's different although i suppose that was really done for best of both worlds though that's why they got picard to become locutus yeah was it's- to be like some sort of figurehead or spokesperson or something like that yeah i understand the dramatic reasons for it it's a, i can't think of any way around it but mm-hmm. it does take a bit of the edge off what makes them so creepy for me. Still, that said, if you were going to be the one being assimilated, you're not going to be a Borg queen, you're going to be a Borg drone, so I suppose it still works on that regard. So it doesn't bother me all that much, I suppose. It certainly doesn't ruin the intent of the film. And it's helped, by, as you say, by a, a, a very creepy performance by uh, Alice Grisha. Yeah, very creepy performance, which I think does help that greatly. A more minor one it stems from a request of Patrick Stewart and I think it's a little bit ego driven and it's not so much a problem with this film as it is with the other ones that are coming up Um, he was on record as saying that he wanted movie Picard to be different from telly Picard so that's why you get this abrupt transformation to a Bruce Willis tribute act (laughs) where he goes all die hard on the Star Trek. Uh, Now it's still a really enjoyable turn and it's got some rationale behind it here given his prior treatment at the hand of the Borg so you know I let it slide in this one or whatever the Borg uses for hand, uh, those weird manipulator arm things that look like someone smashed a clock over them. But, you know, it's just a less interesting character overall than the sort of seasoned, rational captain that you've known in the series. And it's not all that much of a problem here, but, well, let's table that until we get to talk about the next film. Uh, So uh, those real silly little niggles aside, First Contact is probably my favourite Star Trek film, if, if... you want to slide cigarette papers between it and Wrath of Khan, and it, as with the other one, just some very comfortable and assured performances from it. I think this is one of the few Star Trek films that manages to nail the comedy aspect down quite well, because uh, a lot of what's been done with Sephiroth Cochran has really been played more for laughs than it is mm-hmm. for anything dramatically serious, and it all works. I think everything that it does lands, and as you say, it's got lots of nice little touches for fans of the series with characters showing up and in ways that make sense for them to show up in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, particularly the, the Barclay one, mm. the old um, Murdoch from the A-team, because he, he's an engineer and he turns up with an engineering question, even though clearly it's a cameo. Yes. And it makes sense. And then you've got the doctor from Voyager to the holographic doctor uses a hologram, which is basically a stalling device. Yeah. So it doesn't really get in the way, and it actually kind of makes sense in that scene too. Yes. So, and that's actually a really funny scene. I think that was it. I hear that Troy... 
implants are very chafing. Would you like some analgesic <laughs> cream or something like that? Yes. It's a good line. It's a really good line. Yeah, it's just it's, it's a really well done and well paced uh, with lots of quite very quite impressive action scenes. Uh, one of the better space battles. It's always been a, a disappointment that Star Trek never really had the budget to do some you know proper serious mm-hmm. uh, space borne battles like that you could these days where everything's uh, you know where CG's an order of magnitude cheaper than wrangling models around. Yeah, uh, it's when um, like after this. Voyager actually managed to get a lot of really, really big scale space battles. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, they were wasted by being in Voyager, <laughs> but uh, they did get some of it, yes. Up till now, the films hadn't really had a lot, uh, which was disappointing. Yes, and uh, this was, I think, certainly as, as good as you're going to see or had done until this point. So I think it all just hangs together really well. It's a really enjoyable film and easily one of the best uh, Star Treks and not one that I think needs any real lead into. As you say, it does a, a pretty good job of bringing you up to speed with everything that you need to know about the Borg and you know, Picard's previous dealings with him um, without really requiring anyone to sit down with a book beforehand to you know get caught up on what's going on. And I think all the characters are you know, well-established enough that if a neophyte were to just sit down with seeing this film as their first experience of the next generation, I think they would get all these characters and their roles and their relationships just from the performances that are being given without, you know, really having to think about it too much or having to ask too many questions. So I think it's a really well made film, and if you're going to watch any Star Trek film from this era, this would definitely be the one to do. Yeah. So back to what you said, Scott, about maybe like an ego-driven thing from Patrick Stewart, but one thing, the film Picard to be different. For me, certainly in this film, that worked because Picard is the great negotiator in the series yeah. uh, and he brings peace and calm and he's like the voice of reason. But these cannot um, be reasoned with. They cannot yeah. be bargained with and they absolutely will not stop until... No, it's something else, isn't it? But yes, <laughs> I, I get the point. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> but yeah, in this film, it does mean he can stretch himself a bit. You remember that Patrick Stewart is a good actor. Oh, yes. Not that he was ever bad in TNG, but the character never really went anywhere, partly because of that TV thing of more or less everybody resets at the end of every episode. Yeah. Which is, whereas in a film, you can actually change someone. Here, he gets that, that scene with Alfie Woodard when he's... Mm, the whole line in the sand thing. Um, you broke your little shits, which and she's great at that. The way, the sort of low-key way she delivers that line is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and it just it brings him to it. Then, so after he's had his wee moment of rage, so it's like stretching one way, then he gets his quoting from the Moby Dick thing, and it's like, if his... Yes, it'd be a cannon. He would have fired his heart upon the whale's white hump. Mm. So yeah, that for me that works. That he gets to stretch himself a bit there. Subsequent films, though, maybe mm, not so yes. much. <laughs> yeah, that that that's really my retrospective niggle with it. It's not so much that it happened here where it makes sense. It's that it happened in other films where it very much doesn't. Yeah, this is comfortably the best of the TNG films. I say my favorite of all the Star Treks. I and like being good sci-fi that Star Trek is at its best. There are some interesting ideas in here, like the loss of humanity and the doing what you need to to win a an winnable war sort of way, and the idea of temptation and stuff. Although actually, in terms of interesting ethical stuff or ideological stuff, it's actually this is the one thing this film maybe lacks is that that's not so strongly in there. Yeah, and it's a bit more about revenge and that's simpler thing. Uh, that's a that's a minor thing. It's just I'm pointing that out because some of the well, some of the later there are two two more later films, while substantially worse, have some slightly more interesting ideas in them. They just don't do anything useful with them in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Talking of which, shall we move on to the one that basically like a really long episode on film, <laughs> Star Trek Insurrection. So. Uh... Just imagine, with with everyone reassured that the Next Generation crew could produce a decent film, there must have been some anticipation coming into this film in 1998. Let's just take a moment to reflect on those poor, poor people who must have been so crushed after watching this thin streak of pish. Um, (laughs) Right, uh, insurrection. Data's supposed to be on secondment to a task force secretly studying what appears to be an idyllic little pre-industrial town on a planet home to the Baku, Uh, but he goes mental, blowing their cover and can only be reined in from his madness by Picard and crew showing up and singing Gilbert and Sullivan operettas at him. They've never quite been able to nail these openings, the Next Generation crew, (laughs) have they? So this nonsense over with, uh, we can get on to the meat of the piece with the crew uncovering the real reason why the Federation and their willfully, almost comically horrible allies, the Sonar, are so interested in this planet. 
the planet's rings emit a unique metaphysical particle or magic. <laughs> the <restores> magic is <laughs> the word, isn't it? Magic radiation. Yes, yes which restores uh, the Baku, uh, making them effectively immortal. While the crew get to know the inhabitants of the town, who it turns out are highly technologically advanced, but came over all the night for some reason not particularly well explained, the sauna and some... Damn space hippies. <laughs> yes, the sauna and some corrupt Federation higher-ups plot to remove the space hippies from their home and steal the magic planet for their own uses, for the greater good, as they would explain it. Once Picard gets wind of this, he decides that is very much not cricket, or whatever the French equivalent of cricket is, and sends Riker and Jordi... <laughs> baguette. <laughs> it's very much not baguette, and sends Riker and Jordi off with the Enterprise to get word of this to the rest of the Federation, while he beams down with the rest of the command staff and a crate of guns to lead a guerrilla war, protecting the Baku against the annoying drones the Sona are using to capture them, leading to an hour or so of boring CG shooting galleries interspersed with exhilarating scenes of sitting about in caves, talking about stuff of little to no consequence. This is perhaps a dismissive way to deal with 2 hours and 20 minutes of film, but it feels very much like nothing of consequence happens in this film, and it's almost immediately forgettable. That's because nothing of consequence happens in this film, Scott. <laughs> the obvious jibe uh, for a film like this would be to dismiss it as an extended television episode, but frankly, in this case, that does a real disservice to the television series which has produced far more interesting multi-part episodes than this vacuous nonsense. I suppose we should congratulate them for picking, largely, one set of antagonists and rolling with them, and giving them an understandable motive for their actions, even if it's pretty small time, uh, particularly when the twist of their true identity is factored in. Uh, it's a shame that they've chosen to apply this newfound understanding of how to write baddies to perhaps the worst set of them that they've ever created. Now, while... Just returning a little bit to what you said earlier, uh, Star Trek's, in my opinion, never really been as great at exploring the themes as its more ardent supporters claim that it is, but there is at least normally some attempt to look at something somewhere in the films. But if there was any examination of anything in Insurrection, it entirely escaped me. Which is not all that unlikely, to be honest. There's no obvious point in this film for me, other than perhaps force relocation is a bad thing. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, yeah, um... When I was talking earlier, really, I wasn't talking about um, this <laughs> film. Yeah. Uh, I um, think it was shooting just for being an entertaining slice of hokum, but, well, it isn't. It clearly thinks that it's a very funny film, and it's not a very funny film. It's not even a funny film. I'm struggling whether to even call it a film. Yeah, I was saying you saying a film, because when I said earlier, you seem dismissed as a, an extended episode, and like some of the episodes are good. They are, but yeah. But just... <laughs> This film, in, in every way, feels like one of the lesser episodes. Yeah. I mean, I know it's got higher production value than a TV episode, but it just enters my head, in my memory, as looking like a TV series. A yeah. TV episode, it feels like a TV episode. The story's like a TV episode. Nothing about it says big screen. Yeah, it's, it's all very low stakes. Really, the only redeeming feature of this film is that it allows me to insert an obscure reference to the excellent Sega Saturn puzzle game Baku Baku Animal, although as you've <laughs> noticed by the sentence, not a particularly organic one. Sell me, <laughs> avoid this film. Yes, yeah, this is not a good film. And not a good film at all. It's just designed to annoy me. <laughs> I mean, everything's bad, like I said. It even just enters my memory as looking and feeling like a TV episode. The writing, the characters, the story... Even just the the effects work, there are a few shots of the Stonar ship. I want to say Stonar because yeah. it's, it's Stonar, <laughs> isn't it? Their ship in this area of space known as the Briar Patch. And then you see them on the monitors. And even the TV series didn't look as obviously like there was just a still picture on the monitor. <laughs> it's the flattest looking thing I've ever seen in Star Trek. Mm. <laughs> there was no depth at all and it looks terrible. Then, just uh, because I'd forgotten quite how much I disliked this when I rewatched it yesterday. It, <laughs> even the, the name drives me crazy. It's like, yes. Star Trek Insurrection, Doesn't. but it's not an insurrection, it's an insubordination. <laughs> they may sound similar to you screenwriters, but they're massively different. <laughs> there's no insurrection here. There's no insurgency against the government. There's a captain not following the orders of Admiral. That would be insubordination. Well done, get a dictionary. <laughs> and then you see, we've got, it's basically the whole film is run on magic, mm. <laughs> including at one point, and it's good too, that while this group of people are running for their lives, there's time for Picard to have a little leisurely romantic interlude. <laughs> yeah. And during this leisurely interlude, 
there's basically a bit of magic demonstrated to Picard, and because the script writers can't explain it, <laughs> because it's magic, um, they have the character just say, shh, don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, Next Generation was always one that was uh, you know, very keen on its uh, hard science fiction credentials, you know, and it was always yeah. you know, really well thought out scientifically, apart apparently from everything that it does. But no, you know. it wasn't. Oh, that's, um, <laughs> you mentioned that. I was going to mention it earlier when I mean, you did the introduction about the crew and things. But yeah, hearing Brandon Bragg and Ron Moore talk in one of the commentaries, either for Generations or First Contact, and they were talking about how they did that because there was always like some sort of tech scientific explanation for how any episode ended yeah and it basically they, they said they would write it like ah captain we can't do this ah mr laforge have you tried taking the tech <laughs> yes but it doesn't work but have you take the tech the tech way or maybe if we take the tech in a tech direction ah <laughs> and then they would basically just send it off to their science consultant and they'd come back with three options for them and they'd choose whichever one sounded best <laughs> And that's slightly more thought that went into this film. Yeah, you don't even get so far as just reversing the polarity, which is the space equivalent of turning it on and then back off again. No, off but what they, did, what they did do in this film is what they did in approximately 402% of the Next Generation episodes to get out of danger, is they ejected the warp core. Yes. Which even J.J. Abrams' film did as well. Like, <laughs> really? Ejecting the warp core again? Is that your own... How many warp cores do you have? I had forgotten that that's how they got out of that big weapon that been like doomsday weapon has been used in them it's like oh they ejected the warp core oh <laughs> goody 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 again really 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 i think the design of the plastic surgery of these aliens is strange yes they just look weird yeah almost as weird as their space chairs which are big <laughs> armchairs with red brocade on them and it's the <laughs> it's the least futuristic thing you could imagine it just it, it takes me out every time i see it yeah Again, there are some of the films we talked about earlier. You can just get into the swing of things. Not with Star Trek and Subordination. Nope. nope. Very much a film you want to swing at. <laughs> yes. Right. There's the, the cave-in with the traditional Star Trek-like polystyrene boulders. Yeah. And, and during the cave the rocks conveniently fall underneath the woman. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's helpful. And I, I, I'm in a really nitpicky mood right now. <laughs> I'm going to carry on with a few more nits to pick. These... People, F. Murray Abraham's lot, you know, Oscar winner, F. Murray Abraham. Oscar winner, F. Murray Abraham, <laughs> who's at least three times to develop, goes, <laughs> And that's his high point. Uh, <laughs> his people are apparently days from death. They make that quite clear. It was like, they, they really are about to die, but apparently still capable of jumping over barriers and lifting and throwing entire human men. Yes. Because close to death means something different. And, um, Certain parts of this film, apparently. they're just terrible hypochondriacs. That's really their characterization. Yeah. They keep on talking about this Zona as being erased, but there were only 600 people on Baku, and these are the people that got sent away from Baku, hmm. banished. So apparently, they became an entire powerful civilization which enslaved not one but two inferior species as a service race, with apparently 17 people. <laughs> Now, when you don't fill the rest of your film with anything good, then you start picking at the things that are left. Uh, there's an awful <laughs> lot to pick at in this film. I think it's safe to say I'm not a fan of this. I guess you'd miss that at all. It might be the worst of the films. The, and they come after First Contact as well. You, I wouldn't have expected this. It's the same director, isn't it? It didn't freak through both of this and First Contact. Yes. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a the same producers and you know it's not the same writer though is it but i mean it's uh, you know there, there was enough quality control that you would have expected this to have some merit to it but there is there's nothing in this film to like at all i mean god knows something like the final frontier is bad but you you can at least see what they were shooting for there was there's something in there that you know, possibly could have worked there's some higher concept at play there and this is just empty there's Nothing. I this think, is this is a rejected script for the TV series. I think <laughs> even Final Frontiers, hole farming, had had more substance than most of um, this film. No, very much no. <laughs> uh, take it away. But of course, I guess we can move on to the the wonders of the redemption, presumably that will come after this disaster with Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, well, let's see how that goes. Haha, <laughs> Star Trek Nemesis, or. The one where the DVD packaging is completely different to every other Star Trek. Not that this bothers me much. Just ignore that twitch. It's nothing. 
Starting in light-hearted fashion with Captain Picard's best man speech at Commander Riker and Councillor Troy's wedding reception, <sighs> the familiar crew members are all ticked off early doors before discovery of a signal of android origin sends the Enterprise to a planet near Romulan space. As an aside though, how good are the Enterprise's sensors that they can pick up one robot from several <laughs> billion miles away? Yeah. <laughs> are androids like neutron stars? <laughs> and if their equipment is that sensitive, why isn't the android that is on the same ship not sending them absolutely <laughs> bananas? I should warn you now that I may get even more than a little nitpicky about this film. <laughs> um, um, okay, where was I? Nuclear robots, yes. On this planet, Picard, Data and Worf run about the surface in a dune buggy with mounted machine gun. Archetypal Star Trek stuff there. <laughs> and encounter first the buried parts of an android and then hostile local inhabitants and make a swift exit. Back aboard the Enterprise, the disassembled android, identical in appearance to Data, is put back together and reveals he is called B4. Ha ha ha! B4! Get it? Because he's a prototype. Yet it doesn't make any sense because you would have had to have known he was going to come before the next one. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, and. As well as looking identical to Data, he is also a simpleton. <laughs> Picard then gets a call from Admiral Janeway, uh, an unwelcome reminder of the existence of Voyager, and is told to go to Romulus, the Enterprise now conveniently being the closest Federation vessel to the Empire, where a coup has apparently happened and the new government want to talk peace. On Romulus, he finds that the new Praetor is a human called Shinzon, played by Tom Hardy, who is a clone of Captain Picard, because of course he is. Created for some ill-conceived plot to at some point replace the real Picard. After a change of government, the plan was shelved, and despite it being made clear that political assassinations and ruthless killing are the bread and butter of the Romulan Empire, this extraneous human child was unaccountably sent to do slave labour in a dilithium mine instead of being killed. <laughs> Obviously, for a weak, lost human child with hereditary disease, being thrust into an incredibly harsh and hostile environment was the perfect opportunity for him to become a naval commander, equally construct a phenomenally advanced and powerful, stupidly big spaceship, trademark, and overthrow the Romulan Senate. Best not think too hard about that one. <laughs> Though it is a little difficult as it is the basis for the entire film. You know, when yeah. you put it like that, yeah. <laughs> It soon transpires that there is no peace plan and that Shinzon really wants Picard's body as he is dying from some rapidly accelerating genetic problem and he needs a complete DNA transfusion, which is totally a thing, honest. <laughs> After discovering this and Counselor Troy having to endure telepathic rape, which is really kind of disturbing thing to be in Star Trek and very unlike pretty much every other Star Trek thing ever, the Enterprise and its crew attempt to flee but are chased down by the stupidly big spaceship trademark. Here the film picks up noticeably, and we are treated to much more action than has been seen in any Trek film since the Next Generation crew took over. And they also appear to have beefed up the Enterprise, the space battle becomes more of a slugfest, with the opposing craft being able to take a pounding, much as they did back in the days of Kirk, rather than one or two hits being sufficient to end things. Way hey, there is an upside to this film. This section whips along at a brisk and satisfying pace, with plenty of explosions to keep the audience smiling, as well as keeping you from thinking too hard about the plot. And really, that's a very good thing. <laughs> you do not want to think too much about the plot. The rapid advancement of CGI between the production of Insurrection and Nemesis means that, despite having a near-identical budget, this looks notably shinier and more filmic than the preceding film, and this set-piece battle still looks pretty decent today, but it's pretty much the only way in which time has been kind to it. Hmm. When I reviewed this back in our The One Liner guys, I was much kinder than I feel now, and I'm struggling to understand why that was back then. <laughs> and on my most recent viewing, I dwelt a lot upon the film's myriad faults, most notably that Shinzon appears to have no motive to destroy humanity, no. which is his grand plan. This being a plan seemingly lifted wholesale from the crappy Bond villain's playbook. <laughs> Not that it should matter, because why didn't the Romulans just kill Shinzon when they had no use for him? <laughs> uh, the frustrating thing is that, 
people like the best of Star Trek, there are some interesting ideas in here. When this was released, human cloning was a particularly hot button topic, coming as it did only a handful of years after Dolly the Sheep was created, and when attempts to successfully clone humans were beginning in earnest. In Nemesis, the implications of this technology is manifest as questions of nature versus nurture, and whether we are more than just what our DNA dictates. But good luck finding more than a moment or two of this to engage your mind. <laughs> In the end, Nemesis is like a brain dead Roth of Khan, complete with the death of the beloved Spock analog data, except that this death is handled in such a ham-fisted way it's pretty much a non-event. Hmm. And the felony is compounded by having the cop-out ready-made data replacement of B4 highlighted at the end. Yeah. Totally undermining any emotion you may have felt at the death of such an integral and well-liked member of the crew. There is a silver lining to be found here though, however unexpected. And oh, this amazing to be able to say this after so many years of waiting. They finally find a use. A use has actually been found for Diana. I'm sensing <laughs> aggression from the people shooting at us, Troy. <laughs> as she helps to locations on ship. Praise be! Just try not to think too hard though about the scene where First Officer Data leaves Troy in charge, indicating that in the future, the third most senior member of the crew of a military vessel is the fecking therapist. <laughs> I will leave you with just one question. Why is the storage compartment of the June buggy exactly the shape and size of the android's head? <laughs> It's almost like the designers of the buggy read the script. <laughs> well, they probably just tech to tech <laughs> when they tech detected it. So tech tech tech. Yeah, tech. probably tech to tech in a tech direction. <laughs> well, how else would you do it? It's so obvious <laughs> in respect. Just reverse the polarities. I watched this again. It's, it's a few weeks ago now, and it has largely faded from my memory again. I hadn't seen it at all since was it 2003? Uh, yes, around about then, I think. Yeah. Yeah. When it was released here, it was 2003. Right, and We've... yes, not very good at all, and it hasn't got any better with age, as you say. I guess the main point that screams out from revisiting this is, hasn't Tom Hardy improved? Because <laughs> oh, yes. he's not very good in this. Yes, <laughs> he's very um... good now, he's not very good in this. It's nice to see his journey because, yes, really. I mean, I don't know whether it is simply a case of improving or whether it was bad direction or whether perhaps it's just he was basically trying to be like this other actor rather than be a character himself. But, oh, what a difference. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's another misbegotten child of a film. Yet, as you say, you can see points in it. The whole clone thing it should have been interesting, but it really just isn't. It's just... A, a kind of whiny version of Picard in a ridiculous suit, not really looking anything like Picard at all, which is a bit of a downside for a clone. Yes, yeah, so that's back when I reviewed it in the past and I was much kinder, but that was one thing that struck me very much. Yes. Was, Why doesn't it look anything like Patrick Stewart? Yes. How on earth did shiny Picard suit and his band of space orcs build that ship in secret and over yes. as a slaves? And overthrow their masters. It, you know, none of it makes a lick of sense. And it's yeah, all there's just... um, as I start, a similar problem in Star Trek Into Darkness, but at least in that case, it was being directed by a high ranking official of Starfleet who probably could redirect resources to, to keep a ship off the books or something and, and yeah. say it's whatever the Starfleet equivalent of the Official Secrets Act is or something like that. But here, they are slave labour who somehow make the most advanced ship in the galaxy, at least in the quadrant. Uh. Yeah, it would be like Roman slaves going to the moon. Uh, it, just, <laughs> it, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, it, it starts off with this bum note of just quite obviously not having been thought through and none of the rest of it picks it up in any respect. There's just nothing here. The, the other two notes of what you've already really actually touched on, the, the whole concept of the backup data is um, just a cheap get out. It's a very comic book movie, isn't it? It's like, just commit. Yeah. yeah just commit to killing off a character because then it has emotional heft. Yeah, I mean, or even just don't put that scene at the end. I mean, yeah. then, then you could just, you know, forget about it and then the start of the next film, if they were ever going to be one, then you could just say, oh, look, well, Data put his engrams onto this or whatever the hell it is and then you wouldn't retcon it at the start of the next film, not just, you know, undercut it immediately. Yeah, I'd still rather they didn't do that, but yes, I... Yes. If you at least don't ruin the end of that film with the the sequel friendly, completely unable to commit to killing off a beloved character thing, 
you know, and and like ha- that happening almost immediately. I mean, it's like what a five minute span between him dying and probably coming back. You know, it's just uh, it's just not dramatically competent. The other thing you say, I, I wonder if this happened to be because I'm pretty sure this is an extended edition that has been released on home formats. I don't remember that whole mind rape thing being on the cinema one, but and I'm sure I would have done because it seems so out of place. As you mentioned, it's just it's not even remotely Star Trek, and it's weird, and it doesn't really seem to serve a purpose. It's just a, mm-hmm. a, a very dark, distressing thing to put in for no actual purpose. It's I, I honestly freaky. can't remember if that was in the cinema cut or not, because I've seen Nemesis since, so I was like, mm-hmm. remembered that, but it's disturbing and unnecessary and inappropriate and just not fitting with Star Trek at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just go back to... B4 and Data for a moment too. They have had another Data, his brother. Yeah. And did far more interesting things with that in the television series. That Data was the one who aspired and was good and moral and lore was basically the opposite of that. It's like, here's what happens when this blank android starts going down a bad path. Yeah. That was interesting, but then it just the only thing that B4 serves in this film is to be a backup. Yeah. I mean, yes, his spare body. Yes. Sure, I'm glad we found you at the start of the film arbitrarily. There's not really an awful lot to like in this film, as you say. It looks shinier, but that is the only <laughs> uh, the only advantage that it has over all the rest of the stuff that comes before it. It's, it's a bit of a shame that the next generation cast were quite underserved in their films in comparison mm-hmm. to the original series, uh, and I, I don't quite get how because at this point. Certainly by the time this came out, um, Star Trek was its own little cottage industry and it had you know, a number of really competent writers doing it for across all the various franchises that they wound up having. And it had you know as much uh, production support as you could really want. It was a franchise that was still you know healthy and making a good amount of money. Okay, it was probably on the turn by this point and I think this is the first film that uh, you could say definitely was not successful only I think it only just just struggled to make its budget back and I'm sure it's you know turned a profit since on the home formats but it's it was a flop and deservedly so but there's films that are almost as bad that have gone in the past that didn't kill off the franchise and yeah. that, even then in this case I mean I know like that commercially it was a flop it really didn't make a lot of money but at least, I mean, if you like get Jettis and Rick Berman, who'd overseen some really terrible TNG films and the TNG series as well, but at least then put Ira... Ira Bear? I think so, Rick yes. Ira Bear, the guy who was in charge of the showrunner for Deep Space Nine. Mm-hmm. Put him in charge, I mean, then give the Deep Space Nine crew a chance, maybe, or maybe put the two crews together or something like that, but he had shown that he could oversee something that had strong characters and a good sustain a story arc over several seasons let alone the course of one film so but then it just got abandoned for seven years until jg abrams came along yeah and i mean i think that's perhaps we should have a little bit of a discussion about the other properties that didn't make it onto the the big screen because i I don't think there's anything more to say about nemesis other than the fact that it's absolutely dreadful and you shouldn't watch it (laughs) (laughs) actually at this point by the time this film came out you couldn't really escape star trek it was everywhere whether they weren't all running you know, first run contiguous uh, you know, at the same time, but you could very easily have seen well, not only reruns of the original series, but reruns of the next generation. Deep Space Nine would have still been going, Star Trek and Voyager was still going, and I believe Enterprise had started up at this point. I, I mean, can't remember exactly when Enterprise started, actually, but it's really been round about then, although uh, I don't uh, think it was ever any good. Yes, it is in that era, and those other franchises did not get a whiff of the big screen treatment after this relative financial disaster fell nemesis mm-hmm. um, i mean you've mentioned in a couple of times already talking about this about the deep space nine but it's certainly i'm fairly sure that's your favorite star trek isn't it oh far and away i remember also for a long time thinking which is also the prevailing wisdom is the first couple of seasons weren't so great the last time i watched it a few years ago on netflix mm-hmm. so i was like i actually enjoyed the first couple of seasons once it got into the dominion wars and there was this thread throughout five whole seasons it was fantastic, I mean, really, the hmm. religious subplot and Ben Sisko turning into a forced ghost or god or whatever happened at the end ruined it a bit for me, <laughs> but the the rest of the Dominion stuff, genuinely interesting, really well written, and I would have loved to have seen that translated to the big screen, because 
imagine like some of the Dominion stuff with a movie budget. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, and I probably largely agree that it's the it's the best. I think I, I kind of resisted watching it for a while because I, I was thinking it was a Babylon Five knockoff, which isn't actually fair. No, uh, I think what it shared with Babylon Five there was the story arc. It's what made Babylon Five so compelling. Was the yeah sustained story arc over so many years yeah and i think it showed that that, you know these guys can actually do it when you're not jetting around looking at a different swirly thing every week you can actually have characters that grow and develop and that become rather more interesting and you you see elements of that in stuff like battlestar galactica the reboot of that and things like that it's it's had influences that's uh, harkened down throughout the years specifically from deep space nine rather than the rest of the star trek stuff which is all a bit a little bit too swashbuckling in its uh, makeup so yeah, it is disappointing we didn't see any of the any of its more interesting bad guys or arcs taken further and having a bit more money thrown at it. So that's that is a somewhat of a of a shame. The other ones I can speak to with far less authority. Well, I, I suppose one thing you did say that for the first couple of series, you, when you go back and watch them, I think are better. I think there's something to be said for a, a retroactive. Continu- well, not continuity, but character develop. You can kind of back plot onto things. So something similar happened, I think, with the first series of Red Dwarf, which first time I think I watched that we would have been very young when I saw it first time, but it wasn't actually very good. But when you go back and watch it, having seen the characters develop from something else, the, suddenly the, the the origins become much more interesting, and you can kind of appreciate mm-hmm. the, the arcs a bit better of some of the characters. So there's perhaps something that goes on with that. The other Star Trek, as I say didn't really have the same traction for me, perhaps because there was so much of it knocking around at the time. This was really the point where I started to uh, drift away from the franchise, not just this film, but Star Trek Voyager. While I hear some defenders say that it got halfway decent in its later series, I think I watched most of the first and second series, and it's Um, pretty bad. There's there's the angry man, and then there was the white half human half Klingon person who remember at the time being written and they said very explicitly it's because for racial diversity they needed to have a white Klingon and I was thinking nearly every Klingon has been played by a white person Christopher Lloyd's definitely white JG Herzler is white the guy that played Gowron is white nearly all the Klingons were white just had makeup on so away you go Um, and then there was the (laughs) the fact that every time I see Captain Janeway. She always reminded me of a crap Catherine Hepburn. She looked like Catherine Hepburn. She sounded a bit like Catherine Hepburn, but couldn't act like Catherine Hepburn, and it always drove me crazy. <laughs> For the first, you know, 812 episodes of Voyager, however many there were, nearly all of them involved pointy headed aliens and some sort of space entity. Kate Mulgrew, yeah, thank uh, you. Kate Mulgrew, who is very much on board with the idea of not only finding swirly space shiny things, <laughs> she would also try and fly directly into them because, well, that might be a way back home or. Annoyingly, that there may be coffee in there, which was on a number of occasions given as the the motivation for driving your ship into a potentially dangerous space anomaly is there may be coffee at the end of it. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. What was there going were, on? I stopped watching Voyager probably around the same time that you did, but I sort of heard a few things. I knew there were like some big Borg set piece battles and things, so I watched a few of them. Yeah, and really, like the TV series really began to reap the benefits of. CGI cost coming down so you could do better effects and a couple of them yeah. for TV budget are quite ambitious and not so bad in a in, at least in terms of the actual action and that's okay and then I can't remember if I watched many but there's some sort of alliance at some point between the Borg and this it's called like Species 7852 or something like that some mm. alien species I think from a different universe or something like that even the Borg can't so they have to team up it was apparently the entire Borg collective plus one Starfleet vessel is what would make the difference but the idea of them actually teaming up and teaming up your most deadly enemy it was at least an interesting yeah. idea now. I can't speak to how well it was done I think what happened is the Borg said that the species have hidden all the coffee and just set Janeway on them Actually, Kate Mulgrew is really good at uh, Orange is the New Black on Netflix. So she's, she's actually a, a decent actress, but yeah, the, the character of Janeway is not, per- or at least what I saw of it, was not particularly interesting. I don't remember the coffee thing, but what was the deal? Didn't they have working replicators? No, for some reason. Right. And I okay, I, so... I don't believe it was ever explained any more than that. Just like we need. That's why they have the they have this chef on board who's some annoying alien called Neelix. And oh yes, Neelix was in. 
incredibly irritating. And why they were always complaining about having to find you know f- local food analogs from the part of the places they go past and scavenging. And you know, it, clearly it was done to give some sort of dramatic impulse to get them to get back home. Resources saved and all that stuff. But yeah, it, it was never really made any sense. They never had any problems with replicators and other ones, but they did hear for some reason, probably because someone teched the tech in the wrong way at some point. All the weapons and things work, but yeah. just apparently not the, the magic machines that every other Star Trek had just fine. Okay. Yeah. And then I think the, the straw that broke everyone's back was Star Trek Enterprise, uh, running from 2001 for four series to 2005, which uh, starred your... Uh, got Bacula. Got Bacula. Bacula the Dracula, um, as I think he always should be. He should be in a dra- film where he's Dracula, so you can say Bacula the Dracula. I think that just makes good economic sense. Um, as I liked him so much in Quantum Leap. Yes. And Quantum Leap was really good science fiction. I really enjoyed that. And then Enterprise, I could watch three episodes like, nope. Yeah, and, and he shows up as sort of support characters and, you know, the, the occasional old film and TV thing. And he's always, you know, good in those, but uh, as, yeah, as a lead. Yeah, when he's in The Informant, for instance, or mm-hmm. even like the voice in Source Code. Yes, but as a, a as a captain, I was not buying him. I'd, to be honest, I'm not going to talk about Enterprise for much, but I think I gave it a chance of maybe three or four episodes and then checked out because it was not great and also had the single worst theme tune uh, history has ever recorded. So it had that going for it. If going for it, you've been repulsed you from it. So, yeah, I, I take it you didn't have any particular thoughts on Enterprise either. No, um, I haven't seen enough of Enterprise to have any opinion of it whatsoever. Yes, so yes, I'm sure there will be some defenders of it and they can uh, get in touch on the usual address. Now, we probably won't talk much about the J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, rebootings because, well, we suspect we'll have a proper episode to, to go into them in some depth, but I, I would say, uh, because it looks, for the moment, it looks like there's going to be more of them made. Uh, I believe the fourth film has been greenlit by this point. I think the budget, or sorry, the box office of the last year would certainly confirm that that was always going to happen yes and i think broadly i like them I, i'm pretty sure you'll be on board when i say that the actual quality of them is showing a downward trend but i don't think we've spoken about your views on star trek beyond so is that slope linear or logarithmic <laughs> it's okay apart from the fact i think a reboot was not the way to go they could have just had something else in the same universe mm. with different characters yes that aside the 2009 film i like a great deal it's considerably less science fiction than Star Trek ought to be. I don't want to say is, but ought to be. Yeah. It's an action film in space. It's a really well-produced one, really entertaining. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Into Darkness, I like almost as much with the caveat that don't think about it. Yeah. Really, <laughs> just don't think about it because cold fusion devices don't make things cold. But just don't think about it. <laughs> you're, you can enjoy that film. You're thinking of a fridge. It's, <laughs> it's, it's easy to get them confused. <laughs> Cold Fusion Bomb Bridge, <laughs> yes. yes. Star Trek Beyond, I really didn't like. Um, I, mean, I, said, I know Craig thought that Idris Elba was pretty terrible in that film, yeah. and I'd have to agree with him. Yeah. The, the motivations of the characters in that film don't make a heck of a lot of sense. No, uh, and also it's the same motivations I've been using for all the other films as well. <laughs> I'm angry yes, with Starfleet um, for ill-defined reasons. <laughs> okay, off you yeah. go. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's the one that least Star Trek and more um, action film. Yeah. Not surprising given it was directed by Justin Lin. Yes. Um the person responsible for several of the Fast and Furious films. I will watch it again. I like the other two enough that I would be going willing to give this third one another go. But for me it's more the first two are really good and then it just drops off a cliff to Star Trek Beyond. Yeah. I, uh, I'm not impressed by that at all. I have to largely agree. I, to be honest, it was a film that I watched and enjoyed well enough for what it was. But it's, I don't know how I will view it when I come back and watch it again at some point down the line when we do this other podcast. It will be interesting to see if we can figure it out at some point how much of that problem is the director and how much is the writer. Because for the most part, it was the writing that annoyed me in that film. Because I don't think Jason Lynn just put in a bike for no reason. I'm (laughs) sure Simon Pegg must have wrote it in in the first place. In which case, what was he thinking? <laughs> and yeah, there's a lot of problems that I think I, I, I would love to know exactly where I can lay the blame on it. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not not the best of the, the new bunch by a long chalk. But yeah, hopefully we will come back to those in, I don't know, 2072 if we're all still around yes. or whatever. I see whether this new TV series goes anywhere. Mm-hmm. Although I'm just, I'm slightly puzzled as to the fact that 
the new TV series is apparently in the original series TNG universe, whereas the films are in this new reboot universe. That seems confusing. Yes, that, <laughs> unnecessarily so. Yeah, I don't get that at all, unless, unless it's, it's also the, the kind of... Uh, I mean, is it actually the same, or is it going to be like a, a reboot, like the next generation time frame, but from the reboot moved forward, or that's why it's confusing, I suppose. Yes, we'll find out what happens in due course, I hope. <laughs> yes, I think... It's only one step on a slippery slope towards Marveldom, yeah. where there's like, you know, 812 million different universes because, you know, <laughs> heaven for fend that there could be some consequence to anything that happens. <laughs> yes. Which is why I don't read comics. <laughs> I, mean, I cannot stand that sort of stuff. It's like, commit to a character being dead in this, the same universe. But anyway, <laughs> yes, but I think that's probably all we really have to say about Star Trek just now, isn't it, Scott? It most certainly is. I think we've exhausted that topic uh, quite, but, um, quite. We do have one bit of feedback from Twitter about Star Trek from Blake Wright. He is from the I'm the Host podcast. Uh, at Blake Wright on Twitter um, says, I recall first contact as inoffensive fun and Nemesis being green. I actually, I think maybe because the, well, one for the colour of the DVD case. Grr. <laughs> and, um, one for the colour of the Borg, I associate First Contact and Nemesis as being the green films, because <laughs> my internal head filing system is quite odd like that. But, yes, um, I, I see where you're coming from, the green. And he says, and very 2002, heavy colour, bald, skinny, villain in black, etc. I'll have to take his word on that, because I can't really associate 2002 with any particular looking villains, but okay. And then... Also, First Contact delivers closest thing to a can in TNG. Perhaps an homage given the Ahab reference. Possibly. They do like to reuse their things, and that's possibly the third time the films have used the Moby Dick sort of reference. If you would like to give us any more feedback, you can contact us on Twitter, twitter.com slash fudsonfilm. Facebook, facebook.com slash fudsonfilm. You could just shout into the ether. But really, be better if you contact us by one of those methods or by email podcast at fudsandfilm.com because we're really original like that. We'll give you ways so you can actually make sense for us to contact us. Yes. For us to contact, maybe you can speak better than I can because apparently I can. Yes, in this world, God mad, it is you who will do the contacting to us. <laughs> So, yeah, if you have any feedback about this episode, your thoughts on Star Trek, your thoughts on our thoughts on Star Trek, your general thoughts, we welcome them all. So please get in contact, we'd love to hear from you. Other than that, that's it for now. Bye-bye. See ya.